In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. We welcome you all to our Perseverance family. And as always, we'll start our conversation inviting Mary. But especially today, because we celebrate a Marian feast day, we'll be talking about that today. So let's say the prayer to Mary that she loves so much. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us in the order of grace. As we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's turn to our teacher, our guide, known as the counselor, known as the consoler, known also as the gift of gifts. Another title would be the paraclete. Another would be the father of orphans. Another one would be, is he's also known as the interior master. St. Paul says we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Abba, Daddy, Father. He's also known in the sequence of the Holy Spirit that we pray in Pentecost. He's known also as a sweet guest of the soul, and he's a sanctifier, he who makes us holy. Let's sing to him as we honor him and his mystical spouse, Mary, today. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God. Fall afresh on me, now on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, <coughs> fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us, fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Our Lady Mount Carmel, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Nishaliola, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. St. Therese, Pray for us. St. John of the Cross, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Michael, St. Rifle, and St. Gabriel, the holy archangels of God, pray for us. All God's holy angels in heaven, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning and welcome to all in our virtual family called the Perseverance Group. We're praying that we'll be able to persevere 
in our spiritual life, persevere in holiness, persevere in our holy hour, persevere until the end. Seeing our spiritual life, as St. Paul says, is like running a long distance race. We could conk out and we could throw in the towel and give up, but we don't want to do that. We want to run the good race. We want to fight the good fight because God has a merited award prepared for every, every one of us here. A couple weeks ago, on my Ignatian forum, I had Mary, Eric, and I called my mother, who was in Florida. And my mother has nine children and 39 grandchildren. And uh, for a year, she taught catechism. And she has a special gift or charism with children having nine and 39 grandchildren. So she has a little bit of experience. And she especially wants their salvation, their protection and their salvation. So one class, she was talking to the little kids and she made this comment. He said, she said, do you know that you have, you have two mothers? And the little children looked at her shocked because they couldn't imagine how could anyone have two mothers? That seems to be a, a biological impossibility. And they looked at her shocked and Mrs. Broom, what do you mean? My mommy's in the house preparing dinner now. My mom said, true. You have your natural mother in the house waiting for you, loving you. But you have also another mother. Who, Mrs. Broome? Well, it's your mother that's in heaven. Your heavenly mother. And that is Mary. And the children looked at her. Ah, yes. One mother on earth and a mother in heaven. And the children understood. Every good mother should say that to their children. Every good Catholic mother should tell that story to their children. You have two mothers, the earthly mother, then you have the heavenly mother. Mary's the mother of God. Mary's the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. And we, we rejoice in that. So today I'd like to talk about Mary under the title of Our Lady of Mount Carmel because on July 16th every year we celebrate Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I like to I like to try to connect Our Lady of Mount Carmel to the to the two readings today. And Today we've got Isaiah chapter 26, and we listen to the word of God that says the, the way of the just is smooth, the path of the just you make level. If we really love Mary, she's going to make our way smooth and level, but the pathway that Mary is leading us the smooth, the level path that leads us to heaven. Yeah. In Spanish and Italian, one of the most well-known songs to Mary is Santa Maria del Camino, which is Our Lady of the Way, related to what Isaiah says. She makes our level, our way smooth and level to heaven. We are all exposed to good St. Ignatius. And if you go to Rome, St. Ignatius had devotion to Mary. 
and you go to the house of Jesu where he's buried, there's a plaque in honor of the Blessed Mother. And the name of that plaque is, I'll say it in Italian then in English, La Madonna della Strada. La Madonna della Strada would be the Spanish for Santa Maria del Camino. In other words, Mary is the mother of the way. And Mary leads us to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and Mary points us to the way. So as we honor Mary, Mary is going to be smoothing our path so that we can make it to heaven. The Gospel reading today is Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. And I think it's very applicable we can say these words, obviously, about Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life, but even apply these to Mary. Jesus says these very consoling words to you and to me. This is one of my favorite biblical passages, and it's a passage that the church uses when we celebrate the most sacred heart of Jesus. Month of June is the month of the sacred heart of Jesus, but we should always recognize the sacred heart of Jesus is always because his loving heart always loves us. You look at the wall in my studio, see that beautiful image of the sacred heart of Jesus, and he's pointing to it. And he's blessing us. And he inspires a lot of confidence by that wonderful look on his face, which inspires confidence to come to him. These are the words of the gospel today. And I think we can even apply these to Mary, Mary inviting us to come to her. Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart. For you will find rest for your souls. For you will find rest for your souls, because my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What beautiful, consoling words that Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary, and find life burdensome, find life heavy, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I'm meek and humble of heart. You will find rest. You will find rest for your souls, because my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If I were to have a bag of heavy cement that weighed 200 pounds, and I had to carry that half a mile, I'm relatively strong, I've lifted weights but I probably wouldn't be able to carry it the mile. But if I had someone, strong man, friend of mine, who said, hey, Father, let's carry it together. I'll do it. I lift weights. I'm pretty strong. I'm half your age. Thanks a lot. So he puts the, the sack of cement over his shoulder, and I have it over my shoulder. Much easier. You know why? Because a burden shared is twice as light. That's what Jesus is saying is when you have your burden, you carry it by yourself, it's too heavy. But if you carry that burden with me, I might get light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Let's go to that passage and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how Mary enters into this scene. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is Jesus saying? Well, Jesus is giving us an image which is taken from nature, which is taken from the fields, which is taken basically from a farmer. Now, I'm not a farm boy. I've always been a, a city boy, but I've got a little bit of common sense. And I know this, that to plow the fields, at least in the past, before the invention of tractors, farmers would have to have the beast of burden, ox or oxen, to help them to till the land. So they would have to have the seed to sow, but they'd have to till the land, and that would be done basically by the help of, uh, of these, these big, strong animals. And they would have this big yoke, this apparatus that they would place over the shoulders of that beast of burden. And then they would have to direct that animal in the right path to, to cut through, to make the inroads so that the seeds could fall into the hole there. And then the seed could take root and blossom into corn or whatever it might be. But what must be said would seem to be paradoxical. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How could that be? Because the nature of the nature of the yoke is neither light or easy. Quite the contrary. The nature of the yoke is, it's heavy. It's cumbersome. It's uncomfortable. You know, unless you get a perfect yoke, it's not going to adjust perfectly to the animal. And being imperfect, the farmer is going to have to basically manage to adjust himself to the yoke of the of the ox or the oxen. So there seems to be a contradiction there. But really what Jesus is saying is this. Come to me, all of you are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm meek and humble of heart. You will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What he's saying is this. He carried the cross. Good Friday, loaded with the sins of humanity, carried a very heavy cross. He fall and he got up. I have to carry a cross and you have to carry the cross. If we carry the cross by ourselves, the cross is too heavy. It's like me carrying that 200 pounds of, of cement for a mile. It's too heavy for me. But if I have a, a young man with broad shoulders, with muscles, we can walk together and we can make it to our destination. So my friends, you have to carry a cross. Don't carry the cross by yourself. You remember that Jesus, when he's carrying the cross, he allowed Simon of Cyrene to help him to carry the cross. Maybe saw the film of Mel Gibson. The cross that was carried, Simon, he resisted at first. He didn't want to carry the cross. Somewhat like us, we run away from the cross. But once he accepted the cross, then the cross became not only bearable, but the cross became lighter. He was able to carry that cross, willingly helping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So don't carry the, your cross by yourself in your holy hour. Talk to Jesus about it. With your confessor, talk it out. With your spiritual director, 
talk about your prayer life, talk about your crosses. In other words, if we keep the cross to ourselves, it becomes overwhelmingly burdensome, almost unbearable. But if we share it with Jesus and Mary, the cross is made much easier to carry. So not only can we go to Jesus, but we can also go to Mary and ask Mary to help us out. There we see in the background of my, my studio here, we have Our Lady of Guadalupe. Juan Diego had a, had a cross that was very heavy. He was living with his uncle, Juan Bernardino. Juan Bernardino, he was suffering very much. He was actually dying. And Juan Diego went to fetch the priest and Mary cut him off and said to him, no te preocupes, no te afflicas, do not worry. Am I not your mother? I have you in the crossing of my arms. You're in my shadow. You're beneath my apron. In other words, I have you in my very heart. And that burden of Juan Diego was alleviated because his uncle, Juan Bernardino, was healed immediately because Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So Mary makes our way smooth, that's from the prophet Isaiah, and Jesus makes our burden light. That's from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Catholics in the Catholic Church in number 44 basically says that the human person has a real desire for God. As St. Augustine says, O Lord, you have made our hearts for thee. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. We have a real hunger and thirst for God. But the world, the flesh, and the devil can squash that. Let's, uh, let's fan the flame of our knowledge and love for Christ in our conversation. Okay, so let right now I'd like to start to talk about uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, July 16th. Every year we celebrate Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And there's so much to be said, but why don't we start with um, where it comes from? I have a little booklet here, and this is one I really encourage you all to, to purchase. I, it's in Spanish, and it was first written in English. And here I, I could only find the version in Spanish uh, for you. So I'd like to just present this little booklet that I encourage you to, to purchase. And it's this one here. It's called, in, uh, in Spanish, El Vestido de Gracia. Okay, in English it's called The Garment of Grace. Now, here's the story behind this. So when we talk about the Lady of Mount Carmel, we're talking about many things, but especially of primary importance is the scapular. Okay, the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Okay, here you have a, here you have a picture, a portrait of a man. He's kneeling down, and you have. Uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary that's appearing to him. He's in his cell. Okay, the, na the name of this man, he's dressed in brown. He's got a halo around his head. His name is St. Simon Stock. Okay, try to remember that name. St. Simon Stock. One of the reasons why his last name is Stock, he was an Englishman. He was a priest, a Carmelite. And they said that he lived in the trunk of a tree. 
So he, li he lived in the stock of a tree. How would you like to live in a trunk of a tree? Probably not, huh? So here you have the, the apparition of Mary to him. Now what had happened was, in the 1200s, he was the father superior of the Carmelites. And he was an Englishman. And what had happened was, religious life was on the decline. Vocations were less. The priests and brothers were not really living their religious life the way they should have. There was a lot of mediocrity, a lot of lukewarmness, a lot of um, basically ingratitude towards the many gifts that God had given them. So it looked almost as if the this Carmelite order in the 1200s was going to disappear because of its um, its poor state. And what happened was this man, St. Simon Stock, had a vision, a vision of Mary with the child Jesus in her arms. And she talks to Simon. And she talks to him in very consoling words. And the essence of their conversation was the following. She said, look, Simon, the order is in trouble. But I've come to save the order. And what I want you to do is this. If you look closely, you can see. Try to get as close as possible. You can see that Mary's giving him. It almost looks like a, looks like a brown drape. Or a brown stole. Or a brown piece of cloth. You can see it there. She's giving it to him. Now, what is that? It's a, it's a scapular. It's a scapular of Mary. So she said to Simon, I want you to wear the scapular. Not only that, but I want all of your religious, in my order, the Carmelites, I want all of them to wear the scapular. And she promised, if they wear the scapular, which is a reminder of my love, the order will not shipwreck. The order will not die. <clears throat> but rather, the order will flourish. So she disappeared. Simon Stock brought together the Carmelites and told him told them about this vision he had had from the Blessed Virgin Mary. Reminding them that they all had to wear the scapular. Now, so that's the story of Simon Stock. Here's another picture of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, dressed in brown. So the scapular, when, when you see a Carmelite nun, maybe you've seen a statue of St. Therese, or you've seen a statue of St. Teresa of Avila, or maybe uh, Edith Stein, Sister Benedict of the Cross, or um, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, or St. John of the Cross, you see that they're 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 dressed in uh often they'll have the their mantle their white mantle but below they have a brown habit in the brown habit it drapes all the way down to their knees so that's actually the scapular the full scapular it's a religious 
garment. It's a religious habit. So the nuns, as well as the priests, their religious habit is their scapular. I wear a black habit, kind of like the Jesuits, with my sash on the right. Religious orders have different religious garments. Okay, what about, okay, that's the history, the origin. Oh, and by the way, it happened exactly what Mary said. Instead of the Carmelite order declining and disappearing, once the religious wore the scapular and tried to love Mary all the more, it's a sign of the love that we have for Mary, then the order started to grow and flourish. And to this very day, all throughout the world, you have contemplative Carmelite orders, you have active Carmelite orders, you got the male and the female, you have the third order of the Carmelites. In other words, not to say that the Carmelite order is perfect or it has overflowing vocations, but throughout the whole world, the Carmelites are still in existence. And partially, because of the Blessed Virgin Mary and that apparition that St. Simon Stock had. So what about you and what about me? Okay, you're not a, uh, most of you I think are not a religious Carmelite nun. Maybe none of you, maybe we have a, a few that are watching me, thanks be to God. But as lay people, we are called also to love Mary, to consecrate herself to Mary, and to show that consecration to Mary by our scapular. So right, right now I brought a scapular to show to you. Here you have a scapular. Now, there are different types of scapulars. There are green scapulars, there's red scapulars, there's blue scapulars. Okay, the scapular of Our Lady Mount Carmel is like this. It's brown. It has two square pieces. It has a string, and you place it over you, over your shoulder. Now, the word scapular comes from Latin scapula, and scapula means shoulder, because you place it over your shoulders. Okay, the scapular of our Lady Mount Carmel, it's brown. Now, probably one, if you've received it, you had pictures of Mary, maybe the heart, that are engraved in the scapula, which is fine. But it's not indispensable that you have a picture engraved in the scapula. You don't have to have. It just has to be two brown squares, the front and the back. And then you place it over your shoulders. You wear it within your shirt. And not to take it off, except when you're Maybe getting taking a bath. Now, this is a my own private devotion. This scapula was made by my mother. Thanks be to God, she makes scapulars, and this scapula is strong. See, I'm relatively strong. The reason being, being somewhat athletic, the stringy ones that I've had, I would rip apart in every two or three months. So this is actually like a shoelace. You can make your own scapula with a shoelace. Now inside this square piece, my mother sewed the Medal of St. Benedict. We celebrate St. Benedict five days ago, July 11th. And there's the famous Medal of St. Benedict. 
Actually, as Father Craig explained in the Holy Hour for the Oblate Priests, studying it, you have these, these letters in Latin. And it's basically, it's an exorcism. An exorcism against the devil. And there's a formal long prayer that you, you make over the Medal of St. Benedict before it's worn. So by wearing this scapula with the Medal of St. Benedict, it's a strong protection against the devil. Yes, the devil really exists. About two weeks ago, I gave a talk on on Gabriel <coughs> Damorth and and the devil and the different attacks of the devil. So I've got scapular in the middle of Saint Benedict which is sewed within this scapular. Now the other, you won't be able to touch it because you're watching me virtually, there's another medal. And it's the medal of, it's called the Medal of the Immaculate Conception, known also as the Medal of the Miraculous Medal because so many miracles have been attributed to those who wear the miraculous medal. So St. Benedict on one side and the miraculous medal on the other in the wearing of the scapula. So there you have it. Years ago, say in the 60s, when I made my first communion, almost all the parishes throughout the United States, on the day of the first communion, the child was given a scapular and he was actually enrolled in the Scapular, he wrote, enrolled in the sodality or confraternity of the Carmelites. That is to say, once you're enrolled, once you're enrolled formally with a scapular, you actually become part, a member of the family of the Carmelite family. And once you become part of the family, you're part of the family always. It's like once you have a child, that child is yours. He's part of your family forever until you die. And then we hopefully go to the family of heaven. So probably many of you who are my age or older, you were enrolled in the confraternity of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So you belong to that and you receive the benefits and the prayers of the Carmelite order because you're part of the family. You have the male branch of the Carmelites, you've got the women, who are the nuns, and the lay people. So we are part of the Carmelite family, all in the family. So it, it, this has fallen out of use over the past few decades, but myself, I've been in this parish for more than 25 years. Every time the first communion of the children, they make their first communion. And what I do is at the end of the ceremony, I consecrate all the children to Mary and I impose the scapular on them. So the very first day the day which should be the happiest day of their life. It's the day in which the children that receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in the Holy Communion. That very day, at the end of the ceremony, what I do in the First Communion Mass is after it, I expose the Blessed Sacrament, I pray the Rosary, we have a Eucharistic Marian procession. Then at the very end, I will have the children come up in line, and I impose the scapular of Our Lady Mount Carmel. 
I'm able to get a good number of them, I impose them, and then the children wear it. Sadly, they take it off and then they don't wear it, but they should be wearing it. And if it comes apart, their mother should try to maybe do what my mom does to make a strong scapular and wear the scapular. Wear the scapular always. So on the feast day of Our Lady Montgomery, we really want to, if you don't have your scapular or you have it somewhere in a drawer, you should wear it. Wear your scapular starting today. And don't take it off, except when you're taking a bath. And uh, But wear your scapular always. Always wear your scapular. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's move to understanding what what is the what is the meaning of the scapular now if you don't have a proper understanding of this of the scapular then it's going to be difficult to wear it because we don't do things unless we really understand why we do them in other words, our, our faith has to be educated. I've said more than once that devotions, we should have the two deeds to Mary, Mary in doctrine and Mary in devotion. Doctrine without devotion is dry, but devotion without doctrine degenerates into, into superstition. That's why it's important that we, we educate ourselves in our faith, having a proper Mariology. So if you don't understand this, you might think that this is a good luck charm. It's a good luck charm that will bring you a lot of good luck in life. Money, pleasure, power, maybe meet your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whoever it might be. It's a good luck charm. That's It's not a good luck charm. Without proper education, it can degenerate into that. Okay, the scapular, it is a sacramental. There are seven sacraments instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The sacrament is an external sign instituted by Jesus Christ to confer grace. There's a classical definition of a sacrament. The sacramentals are many. Sacramental would be a medal, a cross, a blessing, holy water, blessed saw, the medal of St. Benedict. Those are sacramentals. And the sacramentals are instituted by the church. So more sacramentals can actually be, be made by the church. Sacraments, you're never going to get more than seven. But the sacramentals are many, among which is the scapular. The three sacramentals, Marian sacramentals, that are most famous, that all of you should have, is your scapular, your miraculous medal, which I have sewn within this, and the third would be the Most Holy Rosary. So remember that. Scapular, Miraculous Medal, and Rosary are the three most famous Marian, Marian sacramentals. I carry my rosary in my pocket. I wear my scapular around my, around my shoulders. And I've got the Medal of St. Benedict and the Miraculous Medal. So I am living with Mary. Now, what, is it, what does it mean? I'm going to try to give you an explanation of the meaning of the scapular. Otherwise, it could degenerate into mere superstition. Okay. By means of an, an analogy. Many people, due to their profession, they wear a uniform. 
they wear a uniform. Try to think about professions that wear uniforms. Soldiers, nurses, doctors, uh, football players. I played baseball. Baseball uniform. Okay, these are all uniforms that specify a specific profession. If you see the pinstripes, that would be the baseball uniform for the Yankees. Okay. The blue, the blue crew, the Dodgers. Okay, these are specific uniforms that make the identification as to who this person belongs to. So a pinstripe with number 99 would be Aaron Judge who plays baseball for the Yankees. He's identifying himself with that team by the white pinstripe uniform. A soldier has on his soldier garb indicates that he's a soldier fighting in the American Army. A nurse has a white garment on. Medical profession. Okay, the scapular is the garment of Mary. Yes. Spanish, el vestido de gracia, the garment of grace. The scapel is the garment of Mary. You're being clothed with Mary. Explaining it in greater detail, if you wear your scapular, wear your scapular, you're saying that you belong to Mary. You're saying that you are in the school of Mary. You want Mary to teach you. You're in the family of Mary. You belong to Mary. Mary's going to protect you and to defend you and to guard you. But also, and this has to be said, also, the scapular is placed over your shoulder and your back, but the scapular is also, it's hanging over your front it's hanging over your heart so look at the symbolism there it's in your back it's in your front it's like mary the blessed mother she's giving you she's giving you a hug mary's embracing you like you see the picture of Mary with John Paul II, or Juan Diego, or St. Catherine Labore. Mary is a mother. You mothers who have children, they fall and they get a boo-boo, or they have a dream or a nightmare. They come running to you and you give them an embrace. It's okay. Mary is our Heavenly Mother. She has great love for us. So by wearing your scapular, you're saying that you belong to Mary. You're in the school of Mary. You're in the heart of Mary. You're in the family of Mary. You're in the loving embrace of Mary. That should give you a lot of peace. In the midst of the trials of life, you're finding your refuge in the heart of Mary. 
Does that give you a lot of joy? A lot of peace? I really believe it would. Maybe some of you, you feel you don't feel that way because you're not wearing your scapular. Well, that's why I'm, I'm motivating you. If you don't have a scapular, get one. Order one or, as you said, my mother actually makes scapulars. You can maybe make your own scapular. And you know, once you have, once you've been enrolled, you don't have to have it blessed again. That first blessing blesses all of your scapulars the rest of your life. Many people, they have this scapular. Father, can you bless? Were you enrolled? Yes. Well, I'll bless it, but I don't have to. Once blessed, always blessed. Now, let me tell you a, 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 a practice that I have for many years. I wear the scapular always. And the first thing I do in the morning when I hear my alarm clock, first thing I do is I say my act of consecration. I consecrate myself to Jesus and Mary. It's kind of funny because I've that act of consecration, which is the short one of Maximilian Colby, I've learned it in Spanish. So my first words I do, first thing I do in the morning when I get up is I pray. And I say, O oh, Senora Mia, O oh, Madre Mia, yo me ofrezco de todo ti, en prebe mi filial afecta te consagro en ese día, mis ojos, mis oídos, mi lengua, mi corazón, in una palabra todo mi ser, ya que soy todo tuyo. Madre bondad, guarda me. Y defiende me como cosa de posesión tuya. Amen. Kind of long. I've learned it in Spanish. So that's the first prayer I say every morning. That's what you should do. Spanish, English, Tagalog, Italian, whatever language you like, because Mary knows many languages. Mary spoke in the language of Juan Diego, she spoke in French to uh, Bernadette. She spoke in Portuguese to the children of Fatima. Mary is the universal mother. She knows us. She knows our culture. She knows our language. She knows who we are. She knows our problems. She knows our struggles. Mary is the best of mothers. <clears throat> so start off your day. Start off your day as soon as you hear your alarm clock by consecrating your eyes, your ears, your lips, your tongue, your body, your heart, your soul to Mary. Start off the day that way. And then what I do is I take my scapular and I kiss the scapular. Did you know that by kissing your scapular, every time you kiss your scapula. What you're really doing by kissing your scapula, you're saying, Mary, my mother, I love you. When your little child gives you a kiss, you say, Mom, you're the, you're the best. Mom, you're the greatest. Mom, I really love you. Mom, numero uno, you're number one. Mom, I really appreciate and love you very much. So by kissing this cap, we're saying that to Mary. Remember the story I told you at the beginning, the talk when my mom said to the little kids, you've got two mothers. What? You've got your mother at your house, but you have your heavenly mother. There she's upstairs. She's with Jesus and Joseph and the Trinity. But she's even she's up in here. She's very close to you. She's looking at you with great love, concern, and compassion. So by kissing this capital, we're saying, Mary, I love you. And we want to experience Mary's love for us in our lives. The church offers an indulgence, a, a partial indulgence, every time that you kiss your capital. You can apply that to yourself that you have less time in purgatory. 
so we can go to heaven as soon as possible without spending a long time in purgatory. But also you can apply that indulgence to the souls in purgatory. Yes, my friends, there are many souls in purgatory that are being purified now of their past sins. And we can help to get them to heaven. Therefore, you see a lot of pictures when we celebrate Marian feast days. I think I've got one here. Yeah, here we have it. Oops. Here we have a picture of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And there you see the souls in purgatory. Let's see if we get this a bit closer. Oops. See Our Lady of Mount Carmel. You see the angels, and you can see the souls in purgatory that are being liberated, freed from purgatory. And there's, there, there's pains and sufferings are alleviated through the prayers of Mary. What a beautiful act of charity you can do by praying for the souls in purgatory, wearing your scapular for the souls in purgatory, kissing your scapular for the souls in purgatory. So by kissing the scapular, you receive your indulgence. Apply for yourself as well as for the souls in purgatory. And I have a private devotion. After I kiss the scapular, I go like this. This is when I get up in the morning. And then I go like this. Then this. Then this. Then this. You notice I bless my tongue three times. So I want Mary to bless my mind, that I'll have thoughts that are pleasing to God. Yes. I bless my eyes, that like Mary, I'll be able to live out that beatitude. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. That I'll look at what is beautiful, what is noble, what is pleasing to God? That through Mary's prayers, my eyes will be, will be protected by the many evil things that are out there today. I bless my, my lips and I bless my tongue three times. Why do I bless my tongue three times? Because I talk a lot. I give a lot of talks. I'm almost finishing my hour talk now. In a half an hour, I'm giving another our talk. So the priest is called to pray and to preach that through Mary's prayers, my words would be very pleasing to God. My words will be able to touch many souls. My words will be able to bring many people away from sin closer to Mary, closer to heaven. And I believe that Mary hears me. Then I take it to scapular and I bless my heart. Why? so that I will experience the love of the heart of Jesus. I'll experience the love of the heart of Mary. Then I start my day. See, every day I start by consecrating myself to Jesus through Mary and by the kissing of the scapular. So starting off the day with Mary. Santa Maria del Camino. Start your day with Mary. Start your day by praying to Mary and asking Mary to bless your mind, your eyes, your nose. We have to be the fragrance of Christ too. Your lips and your heart. So if you don't have your scapular, try to get the scapular. Wear your scapular. And by putting it on like this, you have the scapular on your back and in your front. It's as if Mary, your loving mother, is giving you a wonderful hug. She's protecting you. She's embracing you. And the whole course of the day, you're living, you're living in the heart of Mary. So happy feast day. Happy feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Our Lady of the Scapular. The Lord be with you. Through the intercession of Our Lady Mount Carmel, may God bless you in a very special way with peace and joy and happiness today. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.